Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service of worship this morning. On the first Sunday and first day in September. It's hard to believe. We also welcome those who are joining us online and through our tablet ministry. Uh, a few announcements before we begin. Uh, the metal tab collection, uh, I was talking to Bev and she just wanted to let everybody know that so far um, they've collected almost a thousand or over a thousand dollars for the Shriners Hospital uh, with their metal tab collection. So thank you to everyone who's uh, supporting that. I mean, that's not just our churches, but their collection, but uh, it all goes towards the same thing. So thank you for that. Uh, KD Lunch Volunteers and Bakers, if you haven't already uh, signed up and you'd like to, please sign up on the bulletin board or talk to Nanette. Uh, or Linda and let them know that you'd be willing to either bake or help out with the lunches or you can do both as well. Uh, fellowship time sign up for the uh, fall winter months if you wanted to sign up for that uh, you can sign up on the bulletin board as well. And uh, Ladies Guild is having their kickoff meeting on Tuesday September 24th uh, 12 o'clock at Family and Friends everyone's invited to come out to that. If you'd like to go to the luncheon aspect of it, uh, please talk to Thelma so she can uh, set up a reservation and then they'll have the meeting after church. So that's Tuesday, September 24th. So it'll be here before we know it. Uh, Bible study, we're continuing our book of Jeremiah study that we started in the spring. So it'll be the last six uh, weeks of this study starting September 12th. And the dates are there to show. Um, if you didn't come but would like to take part, please feel free to come and we'll catch you up. Uh, session meeting, just a reminder for the session here at St. John's that uh, we have a meeting next Sunday after church. And today devotionals for September, October are uh, available as well if you haven't picked one up already. They start today. And as always, if uh, you want to be a part of the email list and you're not already, you can uh, just contact me at my email and I will add you to the list. And also just a reminder, there's fellowship time today after church, so please... Feel free to stay and uh, join with each other and enjoy some refreshments together. Any other announcements before we begin? All right. Let us continue our journey through the catechism for today. Question 89. What is the forgiveness of sins? Forgiveness is God's costly act in Jesus Christ to pardon sinners and to restore our broken relationships both with God and with one another. Faith, repentance, and baptism are the means by which we receive forgiveness. In forgiving others, we share the peace of Christ. And which two other words are sometimes used to express the wonder and reality of forgiveness? The Bible speaks of justification and sanctification. They describe God's gracious work of forgiveness, a work which is one and inseparable, and yet has two distinct aspects to it. Let us join together as we sing our intro to Open Our Eyes, Lord. worship you, heart, body, mind, and soul. Slowly gather to God for you in our prayer and praise the joyful thanks. Amen. Let us join as we sing, Immortal, Invisible, God Only One.
Let's come before God in our gathering prayer. Faithful God, in your creation you've made the seasons to change, the sun to shine, and the rain to fall, the vines to bear fruit, and the fields to produce good things. You alone are our strength and security. You alone bring us rest and comfort. We turn to you as the source of all life, marveling at your wisdom, seeking to learn your purpose for our lives. We offer you our praise and thanksgiving, for you are the God who made us, the Christ who mends us, and the Spirit who brings us life. Lord, hear us now as we confess. Faithful God, even though we know you are the source of our lives, we confess we often turn our backs on you. We hear your word, but often follow our own ways. We see others in need, but too often prefer to meet our own needs first. We harbor anger and say things that cause others pain instead of reconciling or seeking to forgive. Savior, in your mercy, forgive us and restore us to right relationship with you and with one another. Lord, together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, while it is true that we have all sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. When we seek the mercy of God in humility, God will grant us grace. So be at peace with God, with yourselves, and with one another. Amen. Let's join as we sing, Shout to the Lord.
Let us pray. God of word and of wisdom, we ask that you'd send your spirit upon us today as we hear the scriptures both read and interpreted. Lord, help us to be doers of your word, not mere listeners, so that our lives reflect the truth that we meet in Jesus Christ, who is your living word. Amen. Our responsive reading today is Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk in the street and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart. Who do not slander with their tongue and do, not, do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors. In whose eyes the wicked are despised, but will honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even in their murder. Who do not lend money at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Amen.
Our gospel reading is a number of different verses out of Mark 7. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and he said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of the Lord. During the long winter months where darkness falls early and it's too cold outside to do much, Ange and I tend to watch a little more TV. When we're doing chores or other things around the house, we often have a show on in the background. Usually we put on a cooking or a home renovation show because we're not too worried if we miss anything. And like a Hallmark movie, regardless of the title, the location, the themes, or the characters, Renovation shows are basically all the same, as they chronicle the process of renovating a home to something updated, redone, and rejuvenated. Now, even if some of the original buildings look dilapidated, or they look worn down, or they've seen better days, the renovators or the contractors see past those drab exteriors and those outdated interiors as they envision something new, something modern. The designers aren't turned off by a little peeling paint or old shingles, broken windows or doors, outdated kitchens or bathrooms, overgrown lawns, trees and gardens, or even awful smells. Instead, all they see is potential. They recognize that many of these homes are well constructed and despite their age and deterioration, most of these houses have good bones and a good foundation to build upon. So, regardless of how much work and effort and time and money it might take, they set out to bring these old places back to life and to create places where people will want to live. But before their visions, before their dreams come to fruition, the renovators need to sit down. They have to plan. They have to envision what can be done to the house. They have to look past the old and the run down. They think about how they can change the space and the functionality. They imagine what it could look like. They dream of the possibilities and they weigh all their decisions based on their budget and their timeline. And then after finalizing their thoughts and their ideas, they set out to make their vision come true. Yet, despite all their planning, as the project unfolds, there's ultimately setbacks and unforeseen obstacles. They discover signs of water or termite damage, old wiring that needs updating, floor or ceiling joists that are cut or compromised, asbestos in the walls or flooring, previously unseen cracks in the foundation, a rodent infestation, or other similar issues. The demo often reveals shortcomings and deficiencies of the house, which must be dealt with to bring the house up to code, to make it safe to live in. Now, depending on the problem, these fixes can be relatively easy. They could take little time and money. However, some of these issues are costly and they can add days or even weeks to the project. Whatever the case, these repairs force the renovators to pause and to reflect on the project. They must weigh what's important and what they want to keep, 
or what they need to let go of. And often these problems make them pivot, make changes, so that they can stay within their budget and within their timeline. And as hard as some of the decisions might be, they're done because they need to get the project finished. Now our gospel reading today begins with the Pharisees and some of the scribes approaching Jesus and questioning why. Why Jesus doesn't require the adherence of the tradition of the elders. Specifically, he's asked why he allows his disciples to eat without ceremonially washing their hands. This is just another attempt by the religious elites to undermine Jesus, to undermine his authority, as they try to portray him as a lawbreaker. But Jesus never condemns. He never speaks against against the Jewish tradition of washing. He doesn't tell his disciples not to or to ignore it. Instead, Jesus confronts his accusers, saying, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, the people honors me with your lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Jesus challenges the scribes and the Pharisees on their actions and on their words. They stand all high and mighty, accusing Jesus of going against the religious laws or not enforcing them. But Jesus says that it's they, the religious leaders, who are in the wrong. In other words, they're the hypocrites. They're the lawbreakers, not Jesus. He points out that outwardly they say the right things, they adhere to the laws, they follow the traditions of worshiping God, but inwardly their hearts are not in the right place. They go through the actions, but their motivations and their reasons for doing so are all wrong. And Jesus outlines that the Pharisees and the scribes are so focused on sticking to the laws and following the rules that they overlook what's most important. They're so concerned about following religious practices and keeping true to to traditions that they forget how God's calling them to live. Basically, the rules, doctrine, and traditions have ultimately become their religion. They've put all their faith in the laws, and they've lost focus of what's at the core of these practices, which is our relationship with God and with others. Now, in this first part of our reading, Jesus challenges the religious elites and us to rethink the context of our laws and traditions, our customs and our practices. He wants us to look at our faith traditions and to examine why they're in place. He wants us to determine what purpose they serve, specifically with people in mind. If we remember, Jesus tells us the two greatest commandments are to love God and to serve him, and to love our neighbors. Therefore, as we look at our traditions and as we look at our practices, we need to think about if they adhere to these two great laws. Or are we allowing these traditions to cloud our vision and our real purpose as they become our focus, they become our priority? As Jesus puts it, are we abandoning abandoning the commandment of God so that we can hold on to human traditions? There are questions we need to ask, these are questions we need to ask ourselves personally, but also as a congregation and as a denomination. What is it that we do? What traditions do we hold on to? What doctrines and interpretations do we hold dear and that we deem important? Now, if we step back, if we reflect on them, are they as crucial as we've made them out to be? Or have these practices, have these traditions grown into something more, something beyond what they were originally intended? And consequently, we've lost focus. We've lost focus on God's calling. We've lost focus on helping others. In other words, do we neglect others and their neighbors to honor our traditions? Now, this might sound harsh, but it's a reality we need to face Consciously or not, we may hold on to rituals or ways of doing things in the church that hinder and neglect the needs of others. And this is why Jesus calls on us to pause, to reflect, to examine what we do and why. And if necessary, we need to adjust or change what we're doing so that our focus returns to loving God 
and loving our neighbor. In the second half of our scripture reading, Jesus builds on this need for reflection in our lives of faith while also referring back to the Pharisees' accusation about the disciples going against the cleansing laws. Jesus points out that there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. In other words, the disciples eating without washing their hands isn't the end of the world. Yes, these rules were put in place for a reason. Practically, they served as a sanitary practice to ensure healthier living. However, these cleansing rituals also made the people of Israel stand out from their foreign neighbors, setting them apart as God's people. But Jesus tells us that neglecting to wash isn't a mortal, it isn't an unforgivable sin. Instead, Jesus' acceptance of eating before washing points to God's love, and specifically God's grace and understanding. Christ's approval of the act also emphasizes that the disciples had it right and that they prioritized correctly. They understood that being in the presence of Jesus, that following him was more important than simply going and washing their hands. In his encounter with the Pharisees, Jesus Jesus makes the point that it's not what's outside, but what's inside that counts. It's our behaviors, it's our actions that flow from the inside that matter. Because it's in our hearts where evil and sin are stored. It's in our hearts where those darker intentions spring forth. And it's when we let these out that we defile ourselves. To make his point, Jesus goes on to list some of these actions and thoughts that we have that corrupt, that make us unclean such as fornication and theft and murder and adultery and avarice, which means extreme greed for wealth or material gain. He talks about wickedness and deceit and licentiousness, that lacking legal or moral constraint. Or envy, slander, pride, folly. Other words could be foolishness, foolishness or recklessness. Now this is a long and it's a very specific list, but faced with such acts and behaviors, we can't deny the darkness and the harm that these cause, not only for ourselves, but for others. And this is why Jesus calls on us to consider our hearts, to consider our actions and our behaviors that flow from within us. He encourages us to take the time to examine ourselves, to reveal, to recognize our shortcomings, our failures, even our temptations. Because when we recognize and when we accept and when we acknowledge them, it allows us to become closer to our Lord. Our relationship grows and it becomes stronger with God as we seek our Savior's forgiveness for our behaviors and for our actions. Our relationship also increases as we ask the Holy Spirit for the strength and for the wisdom to overcome our shortcomings and the sin that lies within our hearts. It's only through our deepening relationship with Jesus that we have any hope of cleaning up what's inside of us and allowing us to live the way that Christ calls us to live. However, this self-reflection can be difficult. If we honestly pause and honestly reflect on our lives and on our hearts, we might discover things we don't want to. More likely, we'll be confronting those emotions, those behaviors which we know we have inside us. Those dark desires and ambitions, those selfish and egocentric wants and thoughts that stem from our evil hearts. Those dark parts of us that are contrary to the love of God and how Christ wants us to live. We all have them. As embarrassing, as uncomfortable as it might be to admit it, Yet Jesus calls on us to take the time to examine ourselves so that we can reveal, we can meet these shortcomings head on. Tackling some of these behaviors, tackling some of these actions and thoughts and desires, they might be easier than others. However, it might take lots of time. It might take lots of effort to confront some of our evil intentions found in our hearts. Likely, it'll be an ongoing battle. Yet, if we inspire to live as followers of Christ, this is the challenge and the decision we must face. 
Like that person renovating a home who comes across structural problems and setbacks and takes the time to reflect and work out the next steps and to make changes to ensure the project continues forward. Jesus tells us we need to confront what's in our hearts head on. And we need to make corrections and changes. First, we need to identify the evil intents. Then we need to repent of our sinful thoughts or actions. And lastly, we seek our Savior's help as we move forward. And in doing so, our lives are transformed as we draw closer to Him, as we become more of the person that God created us to be. Therefore, let us examine, let us reflect on our inner being as we seek to renovate, as we seek to change our hearts to be more like Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, if we stop to reflect on our hearts and on our lives, we must admit that there's darkness within us. We have intents and desires and thoughts and motivations that are contrary to your love. Lord, help us to recognize and help us to own up to these shortcomings. And with the guidance and wisdom and strength of the Holy Spirit, may we seek to clean up and renew our hearts so that we might be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning just, and this week, you can silently reflect and examine your heart. And what do you need to change? And when you discover those, ask God for the strength and wisdom to do so. This week's mission moment. In an indigenous community in Guatemala, Mercedes Coronado, uh, sorry, Coronado, a teacher and mother of eight, shares her transformative journey as the vice president of the agroecological group Los Arbolitos. The community women once faced challenges including violence and a lack of decision-making power within their households. With the support of PWSD's local partner, the Maya Mam Indigenous Association for Development, Mercedes and the women are experiencing positive change through educating, education and training programs, enabling them to advocate for themselves and future generations. Mercedes is grateful for her husband's strong support in her career pursuits, emphasizing the importance of gender equality and fostering harmonious relationships and eliminating discrimination. So we lift up this ministry and others like it around the world that can uh, happen because of donations to things like PWS and D. In the letter of James, he records that there are very generous acts and they come from God. So let our offering today reflect God's generosity. Let it reflect our gratitude for every gift that we have received through God's faithfulness to us, our offering will now be received. Lord, great is your faithfulness. And so we offer to you a portion of what we have received through your unfailing goodness. Lord, bless these gifts and our lives so that your love is proclaimed to the world through all we accomplish in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our friend and Savior. Amen. Let us join together as we sing to show by touch and word.
Please be seated. As we come before God and praying for our worlds, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray. God, whose word created life, we give you thanks for the abundance that we enjoy from earth's goodness, from the beauty of the shoreline, beaches, fields, and gardens, to the forest, rivers, and streams. Lord, make us wise caretakers of the earth's fragile balance, which we recognize as vulnerable to droughts and disasters. May your world become a place of abundance for all your creatures, for we know all our lives depend on you. Lord, in your mercy. And God of transforming love, we are grateful to live in a land which is mostly peaceful, with leaders accountable for their decisions. We pray for those who face racism, violence, and greed in our communities and in many other nations. Lord, open people's hearts and minds to recognize the harm that's caused and help us build a common life where all people find dignity in their work, are rewarded fairly, and respected fully. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of vigilant care, thank you for the strength and the comfort that you offer us in times of sorrow and of stress. We pray for those who don't know security in their lives, for those facing financial pressures, for the vulnerable who must depend on others for their care, and for those who feel exhausted by the responsibilities that they carry. Lord, guide us to shape a society where the weak are protected, where the elderly are honored for their experience, and children are cherished for their potential. Lord, in your mercy. And God of all times and places, as the summer moves towards autumn and activities re reorganize for another season, we pray for families who face decisions about schooling and for churches and organizations planning programs. Equip us all with the wisdom to plan well and act with understanding for those eager to get things going and for those anxious about moving too quickly. Lord, in your mercy. And God, who hears our desires even in the silence of our hearts, listen now as we name before you the people and the situations on our minds today. Almighty God, receive all our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
The book of James instructs God's beloved to let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Be doers of the words, and not merely hearers. Therefore, go with these words on your hearts, and may the God of wisdom guide you, the Christ of mercy walk beside you, and the spirit of hope inspire you each and every day, now and always. Amen. Thank you.